Well, thank you very much, Gary, and I want to thank all of you for your kind invitation to share my thoughts with you through this lecture on peace building through partnerships, drawn from the experience of both the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland and from my own broader experience of working in a sharply contested society during periods of open violence, as well as during the search for how we might find ways to live with ourselves. As many of you here know, Northern Ireland is a small society, 1.6 million people, living in a small area, but with a legacy of a history that stretches back over many hundreds of years. In terms of history, memory and divided identity, it is, as the poet Seamus Heaney described in his poem Bogland, every lair they strip seems camped on before. The bog holes might be Atlantic seepage. The wet centre is bottomless. And arguably, it has taken a diverse range of partnership negotiation and working to plumb the depths of our divisions in order to start harvesting positive results from these different layers of society. In introducing the term peace building, I like the description designed by Professor Jean-Paul Lederach the noted US theorist, academic, and peace-building practitioner, who so often took the time to contribute to our understanding and framing of issues in Northern Ireland. The juxtapositioning of building peace that is elusive yet attainable presents the challenge, very often an apparently vain challenge in our case, through some 30 years of violence. And yet there were perpetual series of occasions for hope that maintained a sense of purpose. This went alongside the irony that gave rise to our local graffiti, such as that that appeared on the walls of the Falls Road in the late 1970s, Is There Life Before Death? And more recent ones, Without Arms, How Can We Tie Our Shoelaces? A local comment on the decommissioning of weapons. Notwithstanding that, Peace building remained a worthy goal. And so, in 1998, under the patient chairmanship of Senator George Mitchell, who must have done something really nasty to Bill Clinton to be dispatched into exile in Belfast for so many years, along with his formidable aide de camp, Marta Pope, we finally reached the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Like so much else in our small parcel of earth, we can't even agree on the name. The sentiments expressed were noble. The mechanisms of power sharing and an a la carte national identity and citizenship agenda were masterly. Although the implementation was to be torturous, we needed political partnership to arise at agreement around the agreement. But more than this, we needed partnership working to prepare the ground for it, the ability to address pressing community issues, such as the reintegration of victims of violence and political ex-prisoners, the importance of being challenged to think outside the box over a range of challenging topics, and help as to what the possibilities were in affecting social and political change. And I emphasise social as well as political change, because all too often in searching for political settlement, the social and economic challenges are overshadowed by the primacy of the political. But the reality is, as in so many conflict situations, it was a feeling that one section of the community was being at best disadvantaged and at worst discriminated against that seeded the roots of a conflict that then created a reinforcing cluster of grievances. The demand for one person, one job, and one family, one house was at the core of our early civil rights movement that drew inspiration from the American civil rights movement of the 60s. And like America, the ethos of the late 1960s civil rights movement in Northern Ireland was confrontational but peaceful. The concept of social justice called for became a combination of rights, opportunities, and a sense of self and community respect. The academic Iris Marion Young, in her work 
on justice and the politics of difference, points out, and I quote, that evaluating patterns of distribution is often an important starting point for questioning about issues of justice. Or in Northern Ireland, as Morris Hayes, the chairperson of our first Community Relations Commission, once said, when people start to count, the system is in trouble. As intercommunal violence and the introduction of the British Army onto the streets in 1969 spun off into the violent conflict that became the signature tune of the North over so many years, the local level campaign around social justice issues benefited from a series of partnerships. These included the critical partnerships that were built between community campaigns around redevelopment, housing, deprivation issues, women's rights, and the technical assistance often offered by sympathetic individual outside experts, very often university-based, although the input tended to be at an individual rather than an institutional-driven level, unless there was funding involved. The partnership between those with resources and deprived areas, which from 1979 became at least in part channeled through the Northern Ireland Voluntary Trust, which in 2002 changed its name to the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland. And this partnership support was not only about money, but also the added value of connections, support, advice and recognition. And this brings me to the importance of validation, the feeling that in the midst of turmoil, somebody is listening, somebody cares, and there is a sense that there is an external validation of local community-based work. This is particularly important in situations of conflict, which all too often result in communities being demonised and divided into them or the other as compared to us, and with the power of rumour and suspicion ruled supreme. But we also had a series of partnerships that provided us with the opportunity to think outside the box, to challenge the assumptions, the stereotypes and the expected. Examples of this were in 1975, at an early part of our troubles, when a number of Irish Americans from Boston organised a conference of all the participant elements to the conflict in Northern Ireland to discuss options for the way forward, led by the now Professor Porrick O'Malley. Loyalist paramilitaries listened in fascination to Republicans explaining their raison d'etre, and Republicans heard for the first time the distrust that Loyalist paramilitaries had of Britain. And there was a sense that politics was not necessarily the sole preserve of elected politicians. Some two decades and thousands of deaths and injuries later, we had the Upsal inquiry, led by Professor Upsal, a Norwegian academic, which invited any and all views, suggestions and submissions on the future of Northern Ireland. Again, the so-called extremes were invited to be included. This was two years before 1994, when the paramilitary ceasefires took place. And although perhaps not recognised at the time, it created space and created connections. The importance of these partnerships forged to allow people to think outside the box was that in the mix, they allowed the reintroduction of complexity as represented by the airing of different views and the potential to develop a range of relationships. Because as I often say, one of the first victims of violent conflict is complexity. There is a simplification to the us and to the them. You are either on one side or the other. And in challenging the simplification that defines you as either a political friend or an enemy, a traitor, are a loyal ally. Partnerships forged with representatives of third parties, particularly either individuals or representatives of countries that themselves have experienced conflict, can be critical. Northern Ireland has benefited extensively from the generous sharing of experience by South African politicians, such as Mandela himself, Rulf Mayer, Sir Ramaphosa, and Albie Sachs 
And one of the crucial things that we've learnt from them is the importance of communication at all levels and all the time. And we also learned from other societies in Central America, Asia and the Middle East. It was for this reason that in 2004, the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland took the opportunity to initiate a small network, the Foundations for Peace Network, of independent indigenous funders like itself working in violent conflict situations. We understood from our own experience the importance of peer partnership and solidarity in difficult circumstances. And sometimes partnership can be as simple as the possibility of a phone call to say, we are here with you, or is there anything we can do to help? And so we arrived in Northern Ireland at the Good Friday Belfast Agreement in 1998, where human rights and equality were stated as key principles but where the challenge of peace building and reconciliation was also flagged up. In 2012, we are still working on these issues while celebrating the successes and every so often recognising the ongoing challenges. There are two somewhat related dangers. Firstly, in not celebrating the successes and recognising how far we've come, and secondly, for settling for a situation of what we call at home benign apartheid, a shared out society rather than a shared society. All too often in peace building, people place sensitive issues in the too difficult box. But then like the mythical Pandora's box, they can re-emerge when least expected to destabilize the situation. And the heart of the ongoing challenge in Northern Ireland is that we have drafted a settlement for a conflict within which we have no societal agreement over the root causes. However, in reflecting on the partnerships that were essential to getting to the Good Friday Agreement, it is possible to identify partnership working between unlikely political allies. For example, the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition established as a cross-community nationalist unionist women's party in 1996 and the political representatives of loyalism and republicanism. It was political partnership working in seeking to build a sufficiency of consensus rather than accentuating the political divisions. It was working proactively to bring a range of political backgrounds into democratic politics rather than seeking to marginalise them or exclude them. Essentially, we established that inclusion works. For too many years in Northern Ireland, we had been too precious about how, who we could be seen to talk to, at least in the public view. But in a context of peace building, it is important to create partnerships with unusual partners. After all, what is new about talking to people that agree with you or that are like-minded? Again, the experience of taking people out of their comfort zones was important. And informal settings helped to create opportunities for dialogue. The Community Foundation for Northern Ireland worked over many years to create circumstances where political ex-prisoners and victims and survivors of the Troubles could also engage with one another and create the space and understanding to allow each other to move forward. Sometimes with positive consequences, but not always, and often with extreme difficulty. However, it was recognised that putting work into communication, connectiveness and linking must occur at community level as well as the political level. And then, of course, there was the challenge of taking the opportunity to change the face of politics. Well, as with the establishment of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, it was certainly tried and indeed, to an extent, worked. The coalition was elected to negotiate the Good Friday Agreement. But it is as amazing how rapidly the accepted party political norm re-establishes itself. 
a norm reinforced by media and public expectations. It takes a major shock to the system to create effective partnerships around the revisioning of politics. And perhaps the most successful recently has been in Iceland after the dramatic impact of the economic re recession. Northern Ireland had its window of opportunity with ideas such as civic forum, a second chamber that was included in the agreement to be drawn from the civic society, and discussion of participatory democracy to complement electoral or representative democracy. But not only at the moment has that window been slammed, but arguably the blinds have been drawn. And this then brings me to the question of what might have been done more effectively. Arguably, too much time and attention was spent in getting sentences into the agreement. And this was important, but it needed to be complemented by building a partnership of the willing around new concepts and new alliances. It is also important that the big concepts of peace building and conflict transformation are timetabled, resourced and reviewed. And there is a need for regular power mapping to be carried out at all levels of society as well as within our local communities. All too often circumstances of peace building can throw up new or reinvented community gatekeepers which are not challenged for fear that it might destabilise a vulnerable and still tentative situation. In terms of gender equality in particular, notwithstanding United Nations Resolution 1325 on women and peace building, this can result in a democratic deficit. But gender equality is just one red flag area. There are other time bombs to the peace building process that we have learned to recognise, if not necessarily properly to deal with. The corrosive aspect of emblems, symbols and memories that can spark off renewed tension and even violence. In this, Northern Ireland and the Middle East can relate to one another. Even the words used are identity laden. The position and role of victims of violence and whether there are a hierarchies of victims and particularly where the needs of victims are ignored or sidelined. Here again, Belfast can relate to the Basque area of Spain in this regard. Moving too far, too fast on reconciliation with unrealistic expectations, which in effect place a further onus on victims. And putting all the attention on the elected political elite aspect of peace building and forgetting the other essential levels of the institutional and the community. Think of all the expert partners that are interested in talking and influencing the high profile political figures. But peace also has to be rooted in local communities in order to flourish and to flower. What we have found to our cost is that dealing with the past takes time and it takes partnership that is constant and patient. Indeed, Ledrec would have argued that it takes as long and as many resources to build peace as it does to wage war. And this is not something that is always recognised in our ticker tape news era, characterised by the press report of the latest sensation or crisis. Hurt is long-term in nature, as are issues of justice denied. We have also learned that there are things that we could have done better. We would have benefited from greater partnerships with those experts and academics that have knowledge of the broader range of peace processes and peace agreements. There is so much expertise held in academic journals and libraries that actually very often seem confined to academic level debate itself. For all that was researched and written about Northern Ireland at, at community level, people talk about this as often being an extractive industry, rarely shared with the people who provide the primary data. Equally, there could have been more training opportunities 
for people entering politics for the first time through the peace talks election in 1996, in the technicalities of peacemaking and drafting agreements. And at community level, there could have been much benefit from partnerships which would have put expertise at the behest of those working to ensure social and economic justice as a, as a consequence of the peace dividend, as well as looking for imaginative ways of dealing with the uncomfortable legacies of the past, such as how to deal with truth and justice and memory. So what is peace and what do we know? Clearly, it is a process as well as a product. It is the forging of relationships as well as the negotiation of how we can live together. It is recognising that as the African proverb says, in times of crisis, the wise man, or woman, builds bridges, and the foolish man builds dams, or in our case, walls. It is accepting that, as Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And in terms of partnership working, it is about connecting learning to listening, but then having the generosity of spirit to engage in conversations about how learning can be put at the disposal of those that are waging peace. It is recognising that noble causes need practical people, and it is having the confidence to ask new questions of old problems. Finally, it is making the commitment to create the partnership working to underpin the noble, if often elusive, challenge of peacebuilding. I end with a slide that reflects a generous exercise in peacebuilding that happened only a few months ago, when the British Prime Minister David Cameron apologised to the people of Derry for Bloody Sunday, which happened in January 1972, when 13 innocent civil rights marchers were shot dead by the Parachute Regiment. This apology only happened after many inquiries some months ago. But it does show that in peacebuilding, gestures are very important, perhaps as important as agreements and economic peace dividends. So I'll end with that and thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you tonight and to share some of my thoughts around the theme of peacebuilding and partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Avila, for helping us understand and share in your vision of building community across divides. We are grateful that you have come to Virginia Tech and shared so generously with us your experiences and insights. Your example will help us strengthen community here in the New River Valley. I'm Kate Preston, a doctoral student in the Center for Public Administration and Policy and a member of the Community Voices organizing team. Avila, again, we greatly appreciate your leadership and vision for serving community and for giving the 2002 Oot Prosum Lecture and for being a Community Voices speaker. Your talk has helped to frame the next part of our conversation with our audience this evening. My colleague Eric Hodges will engage you with some questions that help us look more closely at peace building, community, and the culture of grassroots engagement and participation. Eric? Thanks, Kate. As Kate mentioned, my name is Eric Hodges, and I'll be conducting the next part of our session here. We like to call this our James Lipton section of Community Voices. And for those of you who aren't familiar with James Lipton, there used to be a TV show called Inside the Actor's Studio. And this was on Bravo before Project Runway and you know, Housewife Beverly Hills became popular. And basically what James Lipton would do is he would bring famous movie stars onto the stage and ask them questions. Someone like Robert Redford or Meryl Streep or someone like that. So we've decided to adopt that for Community Voices, and I'm going to be playing James Lipton, and we've got Meryl Streep over here. Thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> she played Maggie Thatcher last, so I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's basically a way to get the dialogue going. So basically what will happen is I'll ask a couple of questions and have a little bit of fun. We're going to have a little bit of fun as well, and then I'll open up the dialogue to you guys as well. So my first question, Avila, is you talked a lot about partnerships 
and building partnerships with unusual partners. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm wondering how you go about doing that. You talked about it a bit, uh, but maybe you could share a story or something about building a partnership when, you, when you're dealing with people that are coming from very different perspectives. I think the important thing when you have a divided society is actually trying to look for opportunities to humanize issues, right. to actually put a human face. Because one of the most alienating aspects in, in, in conflict situations is when people start talking in terms of statistics. Right. You know, 10,000 people injured, 30,000 30, ex-prisoners, which we had, so many people killed. Mm. So it's looking to actually find a story and a, and a human face that can then actually open a conversation with people from a different perspective. Okay. And in terms of, say, working with um, victims of violence who were bereaved from, from different quarters, one perhaps might, might had a father killed by the IRA, the Republican sure. paramilitary, somebody else might be a, a victim of the British Army or whatever. It's actually getting those people to, act, to open up and tell their stories. Right. And a number of approaches were taken in terms of, of, of trying to do this. An early one was using um, imaginative approaches, like things like the, your, your AIDS quilt, but, but where we actually um, funded a number of groups to use something, some memory of their loved one who, was, who had been killed to, to, to form a, a patch as part of a patchwork quilt. So it could have been a, something from a soccer jacket, it could have been a, a First Communion dress, it could have been a photograph, it could have been uh, something from a wedding. And, and when, when, when people came together from, from, from different backgrounds, they could actually relate to that because they could engage with the individual and, and, and the family experience rather than starting from an ideological perspective or a political framing. And that then at least started to open up the, the conversation. So I think that really is, 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 is how we, we managed it best. So you were coming from a place of similarity more than a place of difference? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. I was, when you were going through your slideshow, I noticed um, a poster on the Belfast Agreement called The Agreement, and it said, it's your future. Uh -huh. And I was interested in that, that fact of it saying that it's, it's your future. Because when you have all these different groups, you know, how do you go about building a, a vision of your future when you have all these sort of differences of, of opinion that you know, respects all the differences in opinions, but yet builds for sort of a future that, that takes all those opinions into account and, and uh, has respect for those opinions. Yes, that poster came from the referendum, which was, took place actually in both Northern Ireland and, and, and the Irish Republic, immediately after the, the agreement was, was, was formally signed. Right. And that was where people actually voted as to whether they, they, they accepted it. So it was very much saying to people, look, you know, it, your vote, um, it indicates whether you're in favour of this agreement, okay. so it is your future. Okay. In terms of trying to build um, a vision of going forward, again, from the Community Foundation point of view, what we, what we did or what we do is to constantly have, a, have an eye to saying, what are the, the elements that can actually bring people together? Where are the common interests? So from our point of view, we knew there was no point us taking a line on whether it should be a united Ireland or whether it should be continuing union with Britain. Right. However, if it was issues around uh, an acceptance of principles of equality, acceptance of basic principles of human rights, you know, I, I, um, ideas about uh, women's rights in society, what type of society that we're living in, irrespective of what sort of constitutional framing that that society has, then people can start to move towards some sense of, of their, their basic understanding of what contract are they having with the state, whatever form the state takes. Sure. One of the things that you mentioned a couple of times uh, in your presentation was uh, civic engagement and civic participa participation and participatory democracy. Um, and we have talked a bit, we talked a bit yesterday about how you thought that the size of Northern Ireland actually and maybe the culture as well is conducive mm -hmm. to participatory democracy. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, Northern Ireland is small, but because we have had such a long period of conflict, we essentially had a huge number of local community associations forming. 
I mean, we would have had about 4,000 for a population of 1.6 million. Mm. And most of those were in poor areas or, or else disadvantaged rural areas. And they grew up essentially because the state wasn't really operating. You know, it, the state had, had found it very difficult to, to deliver services and to represent people. And also because for a long time we had no local politics because we were ruled directly by, by half a dozen government ministers from Westminster sure. that were direct rule ministers. So in essence, the community and civic society grew up to fill that vacuum right. um, and, and, and began to, to, to represent people. Uh, and that really was where the idea that the Women's Coalition put forward uh, of, of a civic forum, to sort of say, was there some way you could actually channel that participative democracy into a, a formal second chamber? I must say, whenever we started moving towards normalisation, the elected politicians hated it. They actually <laughs> saw it as a real threat. Right. Uh, and it was very much this sense of, and who do you speak for? Mm. Uh, whereas actually we're sort of saying, well, you know, democracy is actually about active citizenship. Right. So you should be encouraging this. Now, in fairness, possibly we pushed it too, too soon because you are having local politicians coming back to take power after not having power for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And they were being forced to share power with one another. So the last thing they wanted was to be forced to share power with even more people down here. So, but, but it is still a, a, a concept that we keep pushing forwards. Because I think actually when the, political, the, the elected politicians almost settle down and get some more confidence, right. they can actually see that participative democracy as being complementary. Right. And actually very useful because arguably... They can, they, they can actually encourage that sort of broader uh, civic engagement to look at and try and deal with some of the wicked issues that the politicians find very hard to deal with. Right. And I always remember we had, uh, as part of our programme of bringing speakers from other divided societies to Northern Ireland, back at the sort of the, uh, 1999, we had the deputy speaker of the Knesset, Naomi Hazan at the time. Um, and she always said to us, look, she said, always remember, she said, Elected politicians don't have the time to explore <laughs> ideas. They are all about you know, the latest committee meeting, responding to the latest headline, looking at the, the next election. So actually, you know, sort of broader civic society can be the research and development bit. And, and, and they can actually afford to try things out and actually fail. Whereas if, if you're in elected politics, you know, if you fail, then you're going to be slammed by your opponent. Mm. So, you know, so we still would, would argue that particip participation of democracy can become complementary. That's great. What do you think are the capacities that civil society needs to be able to fulfill that role as an innovator and somebody that can actually put forward new ideas? I think one of the, one of the problems that we have come to is sometimes that um, civic society are so conditioned by where the next book is coming from, the next dollar is coming mm -hmm. from, the next pound is coming from, that they actually find it quite difficult to actually engage in, in, in ideas. And I would always argue that one of the roles of independent philanthropy is mm. to try and fund that sort of civic society to be able to have the space to engage in new thinking. I think, again, um, we would always feel very strongly that in engaging in that thinking, that it does not become the preserve of what's called rather, I suppose, patronisingly by some at home, as the chattering classes the people that have the money and the opportunity right, to do it. Right. But actually, it is also going back to talk to those in the more disadvantaged communities mm. who also have ideas, who don't have all the answers, but then who does have the answers. Sure. But actually, you know, to give them place and bring forward ideas as well and have create conversations. Yeah. Um, as a community foundation, we have instituted over a period of time an annual community convention, mm -hmm. you know, where we invite along all the different sort of grantees and sort of local groups to both comment on our work and to sort of say, you know, you're getting this wrong or you're missing an opportunity here, but also to talk to each other. Sure. Because many of them are for single identity areas. And that's the sort of place that you start picking up little nuggets of opportunities mm -hmm. in terms of how to move forward. Great. I'm glad you brought up sort of the distinction between, uh, I can't remember, the chattering, what was the? What chattering did you, class. The chattering class, yeah. The, <laughs> the difference between the chattering class and maybe the, the more disadvantaged classes. Mm -hmm. Because we've also talked about, and I know you've done some work with the rural communities, mm -hmm. uh, the distinction between the sectarian divisions 
in the urban areas and in the, in the rural areas in Northern Ireland. And I found it very interesting how you talked about how that played out. Maybe you could discuss that a bit for us. Okay, well in, in, in urban areas, particularly in Belfast and Derry, the sectarian divisions are in your face. I mean, in Belfast, we still have 88 peace walls, which are literally high walls, in many cases 30 foot high, dividing communities mm. between mainly Catholic nationalist Republican communities and Protestant unionist loyalists. So to an extent, while it might be uncomfortable, you can't avoid talking about division, uh, and you can't avoid talking about territoriality. In rural areas, it's much more hidden. It's still as deep, you know, and people in there will mentally know where any family stands in the divide. And actually, there's some, there was some very interesting anthropological studies done of rural villages in Northern Ireland, where you know they, they followed people's shopping patterns, and the, the Catholic community shopped in the Catholic butchers and the Catholic pharmacy, and the Protestant community had their parallels. So actually, it was actually quite deep, right. but nobody would speak about it because there was this sense of we are all part of this, this neighbourhood, this, this town's land, this country area. Sure. So it, it, you had to actually really sort of probe in a different way in terms of getting those discussions. Um, and, and that is, is ongoing, but as I say, it's, it's, it's a much longer term process. Sure. And the other point I think I, I made in previous discussion with you, in, in urban communities, people will take the opportunity to try different things. In our case, in rural areas, you know, people are, are much slower about trying something new right. because if it doesn't work, not only will it, will it be held against them, <laughs> but it will be held against their family for the next three generations. Right. You know, and people will say, oh, his grandfather tried that and it didn't work, so we don't see why we should do it now. <laughs> Great. Okay, so those of you who have watched Inside the Actor's Studio know that James Lipton can't end his session without asking a famous questionnaire by a French journalist named Bernard Pivot. Mm -hmm. And he asked this questionnaire of everybody, so I'm going to ask you some of these questions. Okay. And then I'll turn it over to you guys, if I can find the questions here. All right, there we go. Okay, Avila, so what is your favorite word? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Imagination. That's great. What is your least favorite word? Um, it's, it's more a sentence. You know. mm, okay. You can't do it. Can't. Yeah. What turns you on? Poetry. Poetry. <laughs> what turns you off? Apathy. Apathy. What sound or noise do you love? My son's singing. Yeah. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? My son tried to play the violin. <laughs> if you could have any other profession besides the one that you have chosen, what would it have been? A writer. A writer. Okay. Very Irish poetry, writing. That's, that's great. What other profession would you have not chosen? Are you glad you, you did not decide to do? Engineering. Engineering. <laughs> okay. Here's the last question. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you when you walk through the pearly gates? Come and join your, join your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> So at this point, we're going to open it up for questions to you guys. And uh, I think Andy is running around the mic. So if you guys can just put your hands up, and then Andy will bring the mic to you. All right, well, I'll ask this question. It seems very appropriate, given that you said um, poetry is your favorite. Um, in, your, in your talk, you quoted two poets, Seamus Haney and William Butler Yeats. And uh, my question is, what do you see or is there, and if so, what is it, the role of artists in peace building? Mm -hmm. We found actually the role of art and drama um, and, uh, um, and music to an extent as well as incredibly important in terms of peace building because actually you can explore very sensitive areas through art and drama much more effectively than by having a debate or discussion about it. And it can draw people in 
without putting them on the spotlight, you know. Um, and we've used it in a number of ways. I mean, I mentioned things like the, 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 the memory quilts that are, that are, are done. Um, we would have funded, I remember, a small uh, project in a school, in a high school, um, about uh, five summers ago now. Whenever, it, just before that summer, there was about four young people killed in a range of different sectarian uh, attacks and stabbings and so forth. And the young people in the school uh, with their art teacher created a, a couple of stained glass windows. Again, a bit like the quilt approach, which reflected their memory of, of, of the issue or their feelings about the issue. And then the parents and the community were invited in to have a discussion around it. But in essence, it sort of diffused a situation that could have spiraled quite a bit out of control. And we would have also used things like drama in a number of ways. We've had situations where victims or indeed political ex-prisoners have written dramas about their experience and then shown them round. But we've also had these open-ended drama sessions, you know, where controversial issues were taken. A drama was, 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 was performed, which reflected on both sides, but there wasn't any set ending. It was then left open as a discussion with the audience as, as to their views about what the ending was. So ways like that, I think, and also, um, I remember we, we would fund community arts or, or, or women's writing groups or whatever during the Troubles. It allowed people to express uh, their feelings about very horrendous situations in many ways in such a way that wasn't rhetorical, wasn't sort of uh, alienating. But, but exploring it within themselves and sharing it with others. So I think it is actually very important. Dr. Goodsell. Did acts of forgiveness have importance in the process? Acts of forgiveness, to be quite honest, have been rare. Um, I mean, I cited that one of, of, of David Cam Cameron for that purpose, uh, and that came a long time after the actual incident. However, there are, because they are rare, I suppose, the ones that happen stand out. So for argument's sake, perhaps one of the most dramatic was after the Enniskillen bombing in 1987, when the IRA placed a bomb at a, um, a, a World War II memorial on the day, the Remembrance Sunday, basically, a Remembrance Day, the 11th of November, whenever it was known that a large group of people, particularly from the unionist community, would gather at that memorial to remember the dead of World War I and War World War II. And there were many fatalities. A lot of people were killed in that bomb. And it was, it was very horrific for that area. And Eskillen is a small district town in Fermanagh. And one of the people that died was a young nurse. She just um, um, trained as a nurse, uh, Marion Wilson, and she actually had died, you know, while under the rubble, but she was holding her father, Gordon Wilson's hand. But he survived. He was badly injured, but survived. Mm. But he immediately spoke out and forgave the, 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 uh, the bombers. And that actually changed the dynamic of what followed. Because generally, whenever something like that happens in Northern Ireland, you would have had the loyalist paramilitaries carrying out like a tit-for-tat retaliation attacks, uh, as they did many times. So they, that generally took the form of them going in, perhaps, and machine-gunning people in a Catholic-owned pub or something like that, uh, where they knew they would get Catholics. But because he spoke out so quickly, it actually took the ground from under the, 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 the potential for somebody to, to retaliate, because he was a direct victim or some, you know, uh, in terms of his daughter dying, uh, and yet he made that stand. And that did happen in, in a number of cases. He was particularly articulate the way he did it. In a, in a lot of other cases, you know, the immediate relative, the mother or whatever, would have said, I forgive the, the killer. Um, but, but it wasn't all, always taken up in the same way. Now, interestingly, and it goes back to the fact of, you know, the way communities demonize each other. In doing that, Gordon Wilson was actually demonized by people from the unionist community, mm. from his own community, because he was actually seen as a traitor in actually taking that stand. 
So even in you know, having the courage to, to take that act of forgiveness is in itself, it's almost like a double courage because you know you are also likely to put yourself outside um, your own community. And one of the things that um, I remember talking to some of the families of those Bloody Sunday uh, victims that, that David Cameron was apologising about. And, and one of the things that happens in a conflict society is that some of those families were saying how they become almost hostages of the memory and memorialisation of their own communities because they can't be seen to be moving outside the sort of community narrative. You know, it is very, they, 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 and it's very difficult for them. Um, so it does take a really strong act of, 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 of self-assurance and, you know, and, and self-confidence to actually take that stand in terms of acts of forgiveness. We are moving towards it, um, but again, very, very slowly. I mean, last Easter, well, this, just this Easter past, the chairperson of Sinn Féin at the annual Easter, which is the... Uh, the the, the, the anniversary of the Easter Rising, the 1916 Rising in Dublin, which was one of the start of the War of Independence. He, in his annual Easter speech, said, we must think about saying sorry. Not sorry for the war, because they won't, they'll say that that was justified, but sorry for the impact of the war on people. And that clearly was, that wasn't said without organisational thinking. So, yes, it happens. And sometimes quickly with very courageous individuals, but in terms of organisationally and institutionally, it takes a much longer point in time. Other questions? Um, Avila, what, what is the relation between memorialization, memory, and peace building? I, I'm much less familiar with your conflict then with the conflict in Bosnia and the former Balk and the, and the Balkans, for instance, where you know I was there. Mm -hmm. And in there, I've seen that a lot of the efforts of the international community to to keep memory of the killings and to make justice have been fossilizing community identities into war discourses. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could comment on this and if you could tell us how it worked in your community. It's a very controversial area, and it's not, it's not one that we have actually successfully managed to, co to come to terms with. Um, I mean, the whole issue of memory, and I, and I made the point that you know, we, 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 we drew up the Good Friday Agreement without ever discussing or agreeing the causes of the conflict. Because probably, in fairness to poor old George Mitchell, he probably would have been there for another 10 years <laughs> if he'd opened up that particular Pandora's box and he was too canny to actually go down that path. However, it has left us with a problem, and that is around memory. Hmm. Because for argument's sake, and, and because my community foundation, by managing European Union funding, funds both all the reintegration of all the political ex-prisoners, and as I say, there's 30,000 of them across the board, but also all the victims of violence, we then got caught up in the political crossfire between who is a victim? Who is an innocent victim? Who is a complicit victim? Um, why would you fund ex-prisoners as compared to, to, to victims? Because they were complicit. Then when we did a bit of research, something like 70% of the political ex-prisoners had themselves been victims before they actually joined up in retaliation or in, in, in retribution. So the whole thing, it, 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 there's no simple lines bet between them all. And even for argument's sake, you know, Whenever there is some effort to, um, to sort of draw up a list, all the names of the people that were killed, it, it's actually that there's great arguments about who should be included, who should be excluded, who was a victim of the troubles, whether it was, it was something else. So it, it's, it's a very fraught area. Um, and, and, and it's come to a head for us in two ways. One, there has been an ongoing discussion as to whether we should try and have, a bit like in South Africa, a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and, and, and we have had a number of inquiries into that, and we've had speakers over. And we've come to the conclusion that we can't, because in South Africa, there was a clear winner, and there was basically a loser. The clear winner was the ANC. And you had the magnanimous approach that Mandela took, where he was actually looking to use the truth and justice to, uh, context 
to create reconciliation. In our case, we've got a draw. And in most conflict situations, it's more likely to be a draw. And as such, then, people are very cheery, very worried about admitting you know, any sort of ground to the other side. Um, so that, that, that is still an issue. I actually came up with a bright idea, which everybody, everybody told me was absolutely mad, <laughs> um, that's sort of saying, look, we're not going to get individuals coming forward, because apart from anything else, we don't have an amnesty uh, legislation in place, so they could still be brought before the court. Um, so if, as many victims do, they just want to know the truth about why their father or their brother or their mother was targeted, or, or, or were they targeted, was it just, you know, cut and cross far, or was it a mistake or whatever else? So I said, right, why don't we have a post box to the IRA, the UVF, the UDA, the British Army, and so does, uh, uh, that victims can actually post in their questions, <laughs> and then they could get an organisational response. I still think it's a bright idea, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it hasn't gone very far yet. <laughs> right. So we're still looking for ways forward. The second play way that actually the memorialisation has been really difficult for us is we've been having lo massive negotiations about what do we do with the uh, Long Kesh, which was the internment camp, which then became the Maze Prison, where all the well, virtually all the political prisoners were held and where the hunger strikes took place, where the, the, the IRA hunger strikers died. The official line and, and the unionist community's immediate response was, level it. We don't want to know. Bill, turn it into a shopping mall. The Republican response was, we want it as a museum. We have now after 10 years negotiation, and still sensitive, got to a stage where there will not be memorialization, but it will become a conflict transformation centre. And we're still very tentatively walking in eggshells as to what might go into that. So it is incredibly sensitive. And then the last thing is, who writes the history? Uh, and um, again, this is something that um, we've been working on as a community foundation, because actually, at the back of my mind, I know the Republicans have already written the history because they have much more of a sense of the importance of history. Mm. And that will cause further grievance in the, in the unionist population. So actually, I, I'm working with my consortium of ex-prisoners from all sides, and I've actually asked them to look at a project over the next three years whereby we would take a number of, 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 of instances, uh, things that happened during the Troubles, and we would do a shared history. It's not an agreed history, but take something like the Enniskillen bomb that I mentioned, that you would you have your IRA people saying, why did they plant the bomb? And then you would have somebody from the families, or indeed somebody from the loyalist paramilitary saying, and what was their reaction in terms of the bomb? You know, so that you actually can have almost like a dialogue through the historical page. Uh, because I've come to the conclusion that actually, depending on where people were located, either geographically or in forms of identity, our history is a kaleidoscope because there are different groups and different individuals and families will have completely different experiences. Other questions? One right up here, Andy. Two. Thank you for being here and sharing with us. One of your PowerPoint slides uh, really resonated with me where you said peace is not just a matter of discussion, but a way of living. And I thought that was very, very nice. Based on your broad experiences, what can you share with us so that we can live and be peace? For me, peace is not even the sort of formal gestures of reconciliation. It is more about how can we actually create relationships? Mm. And how can we create relationships that are between communities as well as within communities. And we have plagiarised Robert Putnam's social capital approach to talk about, yes, there is bonding social capital very easily developed, actually, within single identity communities because they share certain experiences and certain narratives of what's happened. But actually, the real challenge is in, in developing bridging social capital, the relationships between communities, and in encouraging through that the ability for critical voices to take, to, to, to take place within communities. Because if you're bridging social capital, 
is only based on consensus and agreement, it's not going to get you, it's not going to progress you anywhere. Whereas the ability of people to actually question their own community's beliefs, I think, is the thing that moves people forward. And the second aspect, drawn, I think, from those relationship building, is, is the development of trust. Not necessarily agreement, but trust. And if you trust somebody enough to know, yes, he, you know, he or she will, 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 will always have different expectations or aspirations, or may actually be fighting for different things than I am, but I can trust them not to go so far as to threaten my family's lives, my community's safety, whatever else, then at least you can start moving forward and leaving the, the room for, for respecting that difference. So I think those are the two things um, that I, I, I would draw out. And it was amazing because, in a funny way, and that's what I referred to, I think, uh, in some of the slides, in our experience with the Women's Coalition, we actually did build up, ironically, um, a, a sense of relationship and trust with, with the other excluded groups, with both the, 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 the Republicans, the Sinn Féin coming in from the outside, and with the Loyalists, the Progressive Unionist Party, which were UVF, and the Ulster um, Democratic Party, which were UDA, who were also outsiders. And I think because we were all elected for the first time, we would all sort of sit down in a circle and sort of grumble about the established polit politicians who actually didn't like any of us. And in fact, I can remember at one point um, a very sort of middle of the road uh, alliance party, sort of, you know, sort of um, party that had been long elected, sort of calling us over and saying, trouble with you women's coalition, you're too friendly with the boys. <laughs> and actually it was because, you know, we were actually talking to the ex extremes. And because we were outsiders, we were able to hear things that the established politicians didn't hear because they'd been negotiating with each other unsuccessfully for 20 years. So they expected, you know, John Hume would say, well, I know what Ian Paisley's going to say, or vice versa. And we'd be sort of saying, well, actually, we're talking to both of you and we're actually hearing something different. So th those outside parties started ending up as the translators between some of the, the, the politicians. But from that, we learned that you could actually build relationships and trust with people that you otherwise would never have envisaged uh, managing to do that. When I hear your story, it sounds like you've been on the journey so long. And I know a lot of people who've been in the field of peace, and sometimes it gets overwhelming and discouraging. And I was wondering, how do you sustain your wellspring of passion and dedication and, and keeping your compass on track? And have you seen other strategies that other people might have done that also can give people some uh, thoughts as how to, to sustain themselves? I think probably in terms of peace building, and it can get, um, well, first of all, it, it can get very obsessive because you always think that your conflict is the worst and that there's no end to it and it's unique. Uh, and actually, there is quite a lot of similarities between conflicts that we've found out, I suppose, laterally. I think one of the things that keeps you on track is that the, the, the benefits are so enormous. You know, it, clearly, as a, I came in as, as a community activist, um, and I, though actually what helped me to stay on track as a community activist, I didn't just come in from a community activist background, I came in as, and as a historian. So actually, as a historian, you have more of a sense of, you know, there are, there are things that can move and, 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 and the gains are enormous. So the gains of, of peace building are huge because it is preventing people being killed. Um, the, other, the other thing I think that kept me on track and, and, and the reference was made earlier to it is we, we are a small society. Um, so from an early stage, you had, you know, certainly I had built up very deliberately a network of contacts in all those different divided communities. And I always had a grouping of people, and many of them actually um, who would know the minds of the paramilitary organisations, that you would triage in terms of deciding what to do. You would never take one person's viewpoint. You would sort of say, right, I've got those six. So I'll take you know, a, a mix of them and then make up my mind what is, what is achievable. 
But you can do that in a smaller society. Now, in fairness, we work with the Tir Neelam Tirachevlin Foundation, a human rights foundation in Sri Lanka. You know, and the situation there is, is, is much more difficult for them. Um, or the situation, for example, we work with the um, community foundation of the uh, northern frontier in Cuidad, Juarez in, in, in Mexico. And Karen, who's the director there, will, will phone up or will Skype and say, you know, there's, there's, there's 10 bodies on the street outside this morning. You know, what do I do? Um, and, and that's really why we did set up the Foundation for Peace Network. And there's only about, sort of, that's about 10 countries in it. Because actually, to, to, to say to somebody like that, we were there at that point. A, you can survive. But B, don't feel that you have to take the responsibility of the world on your shoulders. You know, think of doing something that is so normal, if you like, that no self-respecting drugs cartel leader or paramilitary godfather will touch it. Like funding a pensioner's luncheon club or, in our case, setting up a mother and toddler group. <laughs> However, setting up something as normal as that in a community that is riven by fear and, and afraid to take a step is actually bringing into it people together in collective action. And once they get into collective action for one thing, even something like doing a pensioner's luncheon club in Mexico, you know, and I suggest to her about pensioners, because again, if you're doing something with young people, that is probably dangerous there, given the age level involved in the violence. Grannies, yes so. You know, but once you actually pinpoint something that you can start doing, uh, then you can actually have conversations flowing out from that and start getting other people involved. And that's the sort of way we probably survived during the Troubles. And then with the ceasefires, you were into a different situation. There was more things you could do. You could be more challenging and move forward at a faster pace. And similarly, you know, we would have found during the violence that the, the, the grouping, the sector that was most effective in maintaining some level of cross-community contact with the women's groups. Partially in fairness, in our situation, not in all situations, um, but in our situation, it was less likely that women would be targeted than men. So they had more confidence in going into one another's areas. But also, because they actually were very worried about their children and what was going to happen to them. So you could actually work with them in terms of moving forward. But we rarely would have upfront during the middle of the Troubles said, and we want with this grouping of women. And they met in Belfast every last Friday of the month from 1981 to now. Irrespective of what happened, they met because they said, if we stop meeting, then it's the, it's, it's the politics of the latest atrocity. But they met to talk about, to moan about the cost of school uniforms or if the rents were increasing. But the political discussions took place over the tea and coffee, where it, where it was informal. But those connections were important because they were also the mothers of the paramilitaries. So, you know, the communities are porous and, and holistic in terms of those interconnections. Uh, and that's why whatever you do, you can actually with a bit of imagination, nuance it in, in, in terms of peace building. Okay, well, I want to thank you all for your participation in this, and thank you, Avila. Thank you.